to everybody from Southeastern Europe, but also from across the world. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you here for the fourth the webinar of the Urban by Nature Southeastern Europe uh, series. Uh, our webinar today is about nature-based solutions implementation with local stakeholders. My name is Anna Mitic, and on behalf of CEUS, Center for Experiments in Urban Studies, I will be facilitating today's webinar together with my colleagues from ICLE World Secretariat, as well as cities from Hamburg and Piraeus. A couple of important points before we start. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and there is also a live translation into Serbian language. So please look for the interpretation button in the Zoom panel uh, or the globe symbol in the control panel. Um, today we have a very interesting uh, line of uh, presenters and speakers. Um, this webinar is being supported by the Clever Cities project and today, Sofo Konyaria Christian, uh, on behalf of the Clever Cities, as a Clever Cities uh, project coordinator from the District Council of Harburg, from Hamburg, Germany, will share uh, her experiences of co implementation of nature based solutions in Hamburg together with local stakeholders and community groups. Afterwards, we will have a very interesting input about local context in Southeastern Europe. Uh, by Julia Zorzi, Associate Professor at the Department of Architecture, Built Environment and Construction and Engineering from Politecnico di Milano, Italy. Um, she will talk about the experiences of the city of Piraeus under Two Horizon uh, 2020 projects, Progerec and EU Polis. After these inputs, we will have a um, chance to discuss with our uh, panelists through a question and answer session. And uh, you can submit questions anytime during the webinar, and we will read them and answer during the Q&A session. Uh, you can submit questions using the question tab uh, of the panel, and please include the name of the speaker uh, to whom you would like to address the question. Uh, while we proceed with presentations, we would also like to invite you to share your name and location, uh, organization, and email address in the chat box in case you would like to um, connect with your fellow professionals attending this webinar from across, across the globe. And before we proceed with presentations, I would also like to give a little bit of the context about the urban by nature um, methodology. Um, today, we will cover the step uh, five of the urban by nature, which is about uh, implementing the nature-based solutions uh, the whole methodology information you can find about Urban by Nature um, uh, website. And uh, I am now very glad to invite uh, Sofo to share her presentation and tell us more about the experiences of implementation of nature-based solutions in the city of Hamburg. Sofo, please share your presentation with us. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. I think I don't have the right as long as you're sharing your screen. I stopped sharing the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna try right now. So please let me know if you're seeing my screen. Yes, it's perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, hello, my name is Sopok Anjaria Christian, and I am the Clever Cities Project Coordinator at the District Council of Harburg, as Anna already said. Today, I will be presenting the Clever Cities Project implementations in Hamburg with the selected case studies that focus on the one hand um, on strong co-creation processes and on the another rather technical and BS implementations that we have had and our approaches there. So uh, firstly, I want to give you a short overview of the location of our project area in Hamburg and the thematic focuses that we have um, in our city. So first of all, as you can see, the project area lies in the southwestern part of Hamburg, in the district of Harburg, and more specifically, it's called like Neugraben Fischbeck. Um, it is nested between the two nature sanctuaries that you're going to see on the close-up map just right now. Um, yeah, so the size of the settlement is growing. You can see the red markings around the um, around the project area. So that's the current project settlement. Um, and then we have yellow markings on the north for the Vogelkamp Neugraben and on the uh, 
um, uh, west side, which is Fischbecker Rethen and Fischbecker Heidrug. So the project area is significantly growing, and uh, so we have to accommodate uh, these needs that are in, in place there. So 29% of the district amounts to unurbanized, one, one could say, because it's unlocked between the two nature sanctuaries from the north and from the south. In this enlargement of, of this project area, the, the goal that was set by the developer is to live close to and with nature, and that's the lifestyle that's promoted, which stands very close to obviously what we do in Clever. Um, you can see the markings, and that's the project locations that we have implemented throughout um, with the support of like Clever Cities project. Um, there are 20 project um, NBSs that have been implemented through us. Um, so there is population growth, no wonder because of this new settlements that I've mentioned. There is increase from approximately 26,000 to 30,000, and this um, trend of growing is expected to continue in the new, new development areas. The growth puts obviously pressure on the social infrastructure and the green places due to the new built-up area, and um, there is also a state highway in the middle, which is crossing by the project area, which is sort of a natural barrier, and one could think about it that way, aggravating even more the accessibility of problems to the natural environments, to the nature sanctuaries. Clever tries to build on overall on the stepping stone approach, sort of to link, establish the links through the measures that you saw to the neighboring nature sanctuaries, but also among one another. Um, also, additional component is like demographics. Um, we have big migration background in, in uh, our project area, and uh, most people come from like Poland, uh, Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, Turkey, um, not most like, but as you can see, the city average is like 34 and it's quite high in, in there. We also have the refugee accommodations um, in, in our project area, and they are located at the fringes of our project um, area, however, have high fluctuation of the residents. Um, and um, obviously because of the changing um, and fluctuating um, uh, residency in, in these accommodations, we had to have really targeted approaches, so to really catch up everyone and bring them on board. Overall, there is high percentage of households as well with, with children. Um, and lastly, a few words about the income level. Um, there are high level of social welfare recipients as well in our project area. Um, and among them also children, uh, so to say, at the high employment rate, approximately 7%, um, which might not sound that, that high, is like between 15 and 65 is um, um, unemployed. Um, and there is segregation between the affluent single family homeowners in this new development areas and in the existing settlement. So that has to be tackled. So those were the um, sort of backgrounds uh, and which, which which were in there and through which we tried to sort of choose our focus topics. Uh, first, we have the clever corridor that we are trying to address with our first urban laboratory with the goal of strengthening the green connections and creating spotlight interventions um, of these green spaces. Second, we have green roofs and facades aiming at creating the vertical greenery um, and this how this urban laboratory has been enlarged with rainwater management topics, because Hamburg is following also the sponge city strategy, and these two topics could be very well combined together. And the third topic is the schools. School yard redesigned, it's called schools, but most importantly, there is the educational aspects of NBSs that are put in forefront. In, in this um, call, especially with, with COVID, we have really enlarged the understanding of um, this call and uh, went beyond the schools itself. So um, Hamburg has a wide variety of topics and approaches covered in all these 20 implemented NBS projects. Some of them have had stronger focus on co-creative aspects, as I said in the beginning, and realization of those projects stemmed from co-ideation of the ideas following the other stages of co-creation together with the stakeholders. Here, the central actors were mostly citizens and the local organizations, and the goal was their empowerment so that they would potentially then overtake um, the ownership over those, those projects later on. So we tried to build on the local knowledge of, of those people um, and uh, co-implement with the uh, expert guidance, because obviously you still need them. There are other projects that have more rather technical nature of um, with a relatively low co-creation. There was always a certain degree of participation, even in those projects, projects in place, um, in the form of at least informing 
Uh, however, we try to go beyond that of like informing and to include at least certain few uh, co-creation elements along the path of project development wherever it was possible. So. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So for apologies for interruption. The interpreters asked if you could speak a little bit slower, please. Okay. <laughs> apologies. I apologize. Um, so um, the processes were mostly led here by experts, but even those close cases, um, Clever tried to foster like interesting governance uh, collaborations different, between different stakeholders. So the overall educational aspects were the primary focus of the school redesign, um, as said, and they were also integra integral element of all the other projects. We tried it through the guided workshops involving in plant choices uh, to involve the people in the plant choices or have like expert led discussions, um, uh, creating some type of manuals which will stay even be beyond the project. So it was not only in the schools that we tried to raise awareness about the NBS um, and the environmental stewardship, but almost everywhere as much as we could. So now to start with the first project that I want to present, it's about the temporary garden um, that we have at the refugee uh, residence. Um, it's a good example of co-creative processes and project that had a significant challenges as well along the path of its creation. Um, the project followed the guiding goal of enhancing the residents' well-being and supporting their social cohesion, which is so important, especially when we talk about the refugees. The fact that this refugee accommodation is temporary, that's going to be resolved, this, this accommodation is going to be resolved at 2026, and there is this high fluctuation of the residency, people coming and then leaving, um, and um, there is a lack of focus in designing the outdoor space around these accommodations because they are temporary. These factors have played a huge role when defining, co-defining the tangible NDS measures together with the locals. So obviously we have had these workshops where we tried to um, get the ideas from these locals. What is that they want on site? However, existing language barriers as well when it comes to the uh, uh, to, to such refugees is something that had to be taken account in account. Um, so we try to do and be creative in our approaches, in bottom up approaches to do like walks, guided walks uh, together with different local foundations to the nature reservoirs to produce uh, brochures about uh, this nature sanctuaries in different languages to involve children through the drawing workshops and include their drawings into these brochures. Um, so um, these booklets and sketches helped as well for them to visualize and uh, bring in the ideas in the forefront. Um, the purpose was to bring them close to the nature and to raise their interest uh, in spending more time in it because obviously they have more other stories and other worlds, uh, sorrows that are more uh, dominant in that case. Um, so uh, the, the wish of co-creating such multifunctional uh, and, uh, recreational spaces was followed by Clever with the support of like funding that we created raised beds on the one hand because they wanted to do some type of gardening and they wanted also outdoor spaces. Um, so we um, financed creation of the octagonal plateaus that they are used for different uh, purposes. So uh, I talked about it helped as well to develop certain skills for these people because they were hands-on involved in developing those plateaus within plateaus under the guided workshop with the local carpenter. Um, it also had awareness raising about the local species through this gardening activities that was um, done together with the locals. Um, however, to develop this sense of ownership, for example, being one of the biggest problem because of the high fluctuation, the people who were involved, who we incentivized often would leave. So leaving um, again, like blank page in, in terms of like starting from, from a new um, to organize those UIP groups. So we, even during the COVID period, strongly invested in creating some type of events, activation events, coffee and cake meetings. And those were very, very vital to keep them alive until the implementation happened. However, when Clever um, ends, the problem will 
partly subside, uh, par partly stay in place, um, because obviously there has to be a constant actor in, in place um, uh, that, that um, need to take care that the activities take continuous. So the next project uh, is the, um, the school project that I wanted to bring into your attention. This is another project where the co-creation was strong despite the COVID impact that has been in, in the school. Here we design, uh, we aimed to co-design and co-implement the multifunctional uh, spaces to stimulate exercise, healthy lifestyle, to provide recreational opportunities in and beyond the school time. Um, the particular schools uh, that we tried to address here were uh, already defined in the project area level. Um, so we addressed schoolyard redesign topics based on the plans that the entire school had um, in these cases. We have two elementary schools and one district school. Uh, the two uh, elementary schools had a plan of entire schoolyard redesign, so we could not do any static uh, NBSs in place. So we opted for the mobile school garden solutions in, in this case. And as for the uh, district school garden, um, we opted for the uh, permaculture garden solution. The processes of this co-crafting the mobile school garden solution on the wheel um, were also um, supported by different clever actors. Uh, we created as well the uh, construction manuals, which included the costs and materials and every detail that you need that stays beyond clever. So that's one of the co-creative elements that was also in place. Um, the idea finding was supported by workshops also carried out by the partner. Here I wanted to show that. So um, there were workshops together with pupils um, where the sketches and the ideas for their schoolyards were developed. There was presentations and meetings with the parents' unions because they also co-funded. So the, the uh, clever thought of always finding the local actors that's going to have an interesting interest and stay on board was in this case through such parents' unions. We also included the school uh, projects in different events like hands-on school model design, um, as, as you can see on, on the, the third picture. And the fourth one shows the co-building and co-planting together with pupils um, and um, parents and teachers in the guided workshop. We again had an expert um, who was uh, leading these processes. Um, so despite the COVID period, this was a very good example of bottom-up, uh, inclusive, co-creative processes that has in the end resulted in a very good co-management concept as well for this project because the school took over the project really with full ownership and they are planning to co-fund and finance any changes, modifications, updates that's going to be needed after the, um, after the clever time ends. So another case that I wanted to present is more rather technical, uh, opposed to the first two ones. Um, so the project is called Innovative Drainage System with Blue Roof Technology. Um, that has been tested at the pedestrian path adjacent to the cycle path. Due to the regulations and the different standards that, that are in place for the cycle path construction, we could not test this innovative solution under the cycle path itself, but, but this pedestrian path is directly next adjacent to the, to the cycle path. So that's where we tried to uh, test it. As you can see on the first point, the laypersons were not involved in this case because it was rather too technical um, uh, for, for um, lay people to be involved, but we had very interesting governance uh, 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 structure among the, or cooperation, I would say, among the actors in place. Um, you following this triple helix concept where we had academia on the one hand, technical university, um, who was using or testing this innovation in the laboratory and never tested it in urban uh, uh, realm. We had district council and we had companies, the planning companies that were carrying out the works for the construction of the cycle path. Um, the path dimensions are like approximately 10 meter on two meters, so it's not whole lot area, but it's a test track. 
And uh, the goal is, uh, was for us to demonstrate um, that the regulated rainwater infiltration can also work function under the pavements, then it's not the only case that works uh, on the roofs. Uh, small details about the system, it consists of converted green roof elements and as told, intends to demonstrate that the same system that works in the, on the roof can work on the, the pavement as well. Um, it's it's uh, composition of the optimal infiltration is being uh, determined with three test areas that we have. The first one using the blue roof technology through the meander boxes. Um, the second one, uh, the meander boxes with further perforation, perforations that has been done manually through the technical university. And um, then there is control segment, uh, third one, which doesn't have any interventions. All these segments receive the same amount of water. It's like 100 um, meter quadrat catchment area for the rainwater uh, through the pipes um, that are distributing the rainwater from the main main hole that is seen closest on the, on the picture um, down below. The tested model has multiple benefits for the future. First of all, it's very useful in the climate adaptation context. Um, especially on the hot days when we talk about about the evaporation of the rainwater or the cooling effects um, that can target the heat uh, urban islands. Second, uh, used infiltration technology can reduce to restore the natural water balance through the system, especially when it's applied to the larger areas. And uh, in case of further fine tuning the technology, it could potentially be an alternative to the necessary sewage systems um, that, that, that are quite expensive in, in some cases. Um, so another technical solution that we have in um, here for you today is uh, the, um, the infiltration bed like so-called infiltration beds uh, with the different climate trees that we have implemented in two streets that suffered from severe flooding over the past few years. Um, in 2020, just shortly to uh, add on here, several fire brigade deployments were there and the cellars of the neighboring houses were flooded. So that was one factor that we already knew was there. We also had the drainage analysis done uh, for the stormwater events in the uh, Neugraben Fischbeck in our project area, that was also financed by Cleva. And that analysis showed as well the same results that here is the really imminent need for intervening or, or testing some, um, so, some solutions. There is non existence of sluice system of the sewage and the topography of the area because, like, very steep. And the narrow street road has created the situation where there was uh, extreme demand to test this infiltration. Planters, um, it's, it's seen as a climate adaptation measure uh, affected during stormwater events. And we also not only address the rainwater management uh, topics in, in this project, but rather also test mm -hmm. the vitality of the trees because we have planted different kind of tree in each bed. We have like six beds. Um, um, so um, the, we, we wanted to see under extreme changing weather conditions, which of these trees could thrive, like with, with dryness and then extreme wetness. Um, yes, um, interesting thing is that here, the, uh, obviously the citizens could not be as well, lay people could not be involved directly at the co uh, design or co-implementation um, uh, stage because it's rather technical and had to be taken into account all the street construction regulations in, in place. However, the, there was huge interest from the public administration itself, from the ministerial level and the district um, level, um, and so the both of them were involved. As for the system, um, the infiltration beds consist of the hollow plastics set in some sort of hollow ho porous aggregate and the top layer is covered with the gravel turf. Um, the surface is porous enough so that the rainwater can drain through this topsoil. During stormwater events, the rainwater then usually flips through the hollow uh, air and through the chambers. After the storm, which doesn't last a whole lot, but just for a few hours, the water is slowly released from this um, boxes to the surrounding area and recharging again the groundwater local reservoirs. Um, 
apart from the flood prevention that we have here as a, as a benefit, the intervention also aids, similar to the previous project presented, to the restoration of natural water cycles. And that is the strategy that is formulated and included in the Hamburg Rainwater Infrastructure Adaptation Program, RESA program. So it's docking on, on existing strategy and a plan. Um, yeah, the one important point as well is this, we tried not only to inform the neighbors, we did that obviously what we were planning to do, but also we uh, proposed the community monitoring, um, especially with regards to the trees. So we have an app um, which has like QR code on site at each tree attached and they can sort of observe their growth and answer the questions and fill in their observation and attach the picture if they want to. That's also an observation how much they are willing to contribute to these processes through their engagement. So um, there were tons of challenges when it comes to the 20 projects I just presented, tried as well very shortly uh, to present the four cases. But uh, the most important challenges that can be observed and generalized across all of them is that there was massive human and time resources needed to build up and sustain um, potential co-implementing groups, the UIP groups, as we call it in, uh, in CLEVA, and to develop a sense of ownership. Because if you want people to be involved in the co-implementation, they need to already be involved early on. And we try to build on existing um, um, networks and local knowledge and through the co-ideation try to bring them along with us wherever it was possible however in some cases it proved to be challenging because the processes were iterative and we were in the process of redefining the projects in some um, instances consideration of uh, built-up structure when thinking about the nbs's would be really helpful for the other cities or anyone else as well in our case as i showed you like only um there there is um two nature sanctuaries adjacent and the um, uh, density of um, the built-up area is not so high means that a lot of people have big backyards and they have very short distances to walk to the green spaces natural green spaces and the motivation to bring them up and get involved into developing further NBSs was a bit difficult at start. So they had needed to be a lot of ice breaking to be done. Um, that probably that can be different case when we talk about like inner city areas or more dense being built up areas. Co-implementation is not a common practice, neither for companies and for public administration. That's one lesson learned and observation and the challenge that we have observed, because obviously we talk about participation at different stages um, uh, and different kind of projects within public administration, but it rarely goes beyond informing them or including them at the planning stage with different um, choices, asking this or that. So uh, the co-creation that is extensive um, concept from idea to ownership and co-maintenance mm -hmm. is um, practice and in that sense it has been a huge uh, uh, learning curve but also for companies because every time we try to find like landscaping companies or uh, other type of companies that we needed to carry on the works and we asked them in our tenders or like uh, bid that they would also include co-creation um, uh, it it became a little bit of a struggle especially with the uh, topics of liability and insurance for the carried out works if the lay people are involved, which is a valid topic and that has to be considered. Um, downstreaming the financing for certain kind of NBSs is also a problem. There is um, in public administrations very rigid structures and regulations for what the district gets, for example, a financing from the ministerial level qualification of the a typical greenery, as we call it, like, for example, street side green stripes, um, what Clever in Hamburg did quite a lot, is not a typical job of the greening department at the district level. They don't get any funding for it. So we sort of had an opponent within a public administration that we had to uh, work on and uh, convince, but not only convince, also understand their points why certain things would not be possible. Because after the clever implementation, the uh, possibilities for maintenance um, would be pretty limited due to non-existent funding. 
Um, administrative structures are not also very supportive for co-creation to the degree that Clever foresees, as, as I mentioned. If we want, and we talk about co-creation of like really giving over the ownership to the people later on for those projects, they might need um, to apply for special use permits, especially if we talk about those NBSs being implemented on the public area and not on their private property. So they need to apply for the special use permits, which have nominal price, but still have a fee, um, explosive ordinance disposal in Hamburg after the Second World War that has to be done for every plot, costs as well, carries certain costs, but also administrative procedures and responsibility over the traffic regulation. So if you put up any sign, doesn't really matter, even in, in sect hotel, you have the responsibility of a traffic regulation. What if it kills? What if it falls? Who takes care of it in case of vandalism, et cetera, et cetera. Those were the obstacles that ob obviously held back also the citizens to uh, stay as a carer of those, of those projects. Um, and generally difficult to reach different groups, especially amidst COVID and the high fluctuation, because for us, the focus point was also the refugee accommodation residents. Those were the big challenges. And um, to it, it's, it's a process, but it needs like time and resources to make this mental shift for developing the sense of belongingness to those projects and having a little bit of vested interest on the other side as well, why they would want to really um, uh, be that level engaged as we um, are fostering and supporting in, in Clever. Um, and the very last slide um, about the lessons learned um, is that our approach to the process was that continuous participation of the key stakeholders through the different phases can increase the sense of ownership. So if you manage to uh, bring along the people who were at the ideation level to the co-design, then later to co-implementation, there is a big chance that we might take over the co-maintenance process um, uh, or responsibilities as well. Um, and perception of the co-implementation as a successful practice. And uh, there is a role of the coordination in, in that. Um, we tried to do it through the neighborhood events, always had like some opening, inauguration, picnics, symbolic gifts for the refugee accommodations. For example, we gave, gave the gift vouchers for the grocery shopping. Um, yeah, we gave sometimes plants out. Um, so just having this appreciation for, for their contribution and the success uh, was definitely a, a um, motivating factor, so to say. Allocation of the adequate human and financial resources should not be underestimated. Um, and it has to stay because the projects stay for it nor only temporary time. Neither public administration has that much resources to uh, follow on that level to maintain this bottom up initiatives and clubs because they really are not experienced and really need a lot of support and caring, as one can say. And um, obviously, on the public administration end, there is the need to ease the bureaucratic procedures in order to foster such co-implementation practices. In our case, for example, we tried to remove, um, for example, this uh, costs related to the, um, the disposal, explosive disposal ordinance, um, so that people, for example, would not have to pay it on their own. So ensuring the co-maintenance at the beginning stage will ensure also the sustainability of the project post implementation. This is the biggest challenge that has been shared among all the cities and it's also not new for Hamburg, but it's a lesson learned that this is something that has to be tackled already at the idea level before you make any steps and invest any type of time and finances into a project because it can really stall the process. So um, that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, I would be glad if I can <laughs> um, give my insights in the very end. Thank you very much, Sofo. Um, this was a really interesting experience shared, but also very well uh, summarized uh, challenges and also lessons learned. Uh, I really like the way how you use the educational processes for the wider awareness raising. And there is actually one question also about that aspect of the project. Uh, but maybe we can leave it for the Q&A session uh, due to the time. 
Uh, and I also like how you include the community in more technical measures by community monitoring, which also increases the trust in the implementation of measures. So yeah, really very holistic and, and um, excellent approach towards co-implementation. Now I would like to invite Julia Zorzi uh, from Polimi, Associate Professor, to present the experiences uh, of the city of Piraeus into European research and development projects. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Okay, so, uh, thank you. I mean, I think it was very interesting what we heard about uh, the Clever Cities project uh, uh, from Sofia. Um, uh, it was, it was um, I, I am also working somehow to the Clever Cities with, with uh, Milano um, City as a professionalist, so we are doing some kind of uh, uh, construction works there as well. Um, by myself, as you said, I am associate professor of the Department of Architecture, Build Environment and Construction Engineering for Technical de Milano. But uh, I'm going to present you a Pireus project, a project project, in Pireus project, the project project that I'm mainly working in, but also Epolis, Epolis project uh, that, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm start working there now, so it's not, I mean, mainly I'm working on rhetoric, uh, but I will present more. Um, uh, since I am uh, working as a project manager of Pireus for a project project. Um, okay, uh, so project is a project with our participants participating eight cities, 34 partners, and for eight, where we are applying to eight different natural-based solutions. Uh, so Prodirec is an, uh, a post-industrial regeneration city. That's how also Spireus is included. And we have the front-runner cities where they have the, the living clubs together with the local citizens, research institution, business and NGOs. And we have also the follower cities replicated where they're, they're replicated the natural based solutions where Piraeus is one of the follower city. And of course, uh, the main one of the main issues is to spread uh, the awareness of the potential of the natural based solutions. Uh, here we see an overview of the project. Um, where uh, uh, you can see the, the front runner cities, Dortmund, Zagreb, and Torin, where, and also Grip, uh, the water, the, where is the Chinese city, while the uh, Cluj, Napoca, Zen, Capireus, and Cascais are the follower cities. We have also among our partners, CNR, that is one of the biggest research uh, institutes in uh, Italy. And of course, uh, our coordinator is Aachen University. And of course, ICLE is uh, the local government uh, government on sustainability um, that uh, you thank you very much for hosting us also today. Uh, so uh, going from this slide, we're just sort of overview of the project. So all the cities uh, we are working together and somehow the front runner cities are the cities that the they are having the, lib the living labs where the following cities are, are I mean, watching or following the front runner cities and try to implement some of uh, the NBS that uh, the front runner cities are um, uh, are applying. So um, I am going to focus today for uh, Piraeus, as I told you. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, Piraeus actually is mainly connected for one of the front runner cities, a touring city, and we are following mainly that example. So you can see. Here from the top of the city, you can see very few green spaces. You, most of you, you know Piraeus is a city that you're, uh, when you're going holidays in the Greek islands, you can take the boats from there. But uh, uh, the green spaces are really, really very few. Um, the different natural-based solutions that we are implemented in the whole uh, project, project are here. Uh, laser activities uh, and uh, clean energy on former landfills, community-based in urban farming and garden, green walls and roofs, local implement, uh, environmental uh, compensation process, new regeneration soil, aquaponics, accessible green corridor and pollinator by diversity. 
interesting. Uh, here, the, the main, uh, the main, uh, the route map that we are following. I mean, all the follow the, the front runner cities, and we also follow cities as well. And so we have um, uh, the um, there is also this is the main process how to inform the stakeholders and how to produce a feasible and read <coughs> uh, to use urban planning and design uh, proposal. Uh, so we have different the preparatory works uh, that you can see on the top, uh, the planning uh, of uh, our trans transformation, and then uh, finally we have the co-design and co-implementation, and also finally the implementation of the projects. Uh, I'm not going to go very far on that in very in very detail, uh, but uh, this is the this is the scheme that we are following actually as a forward city, but also the front runner cities. Uh, so here you can see the uh, preparatory works, analysis, vision, site and natural based solutions, stakeholders, groups, planning um, states where we have the vision uh, validation, scenario alternatives, alternative evaluation, scenario selection. And finally, we have the core design, design and final proposal, schedule plan, maintenance plan and roles. Uh, so uh, here we can see the area of Piraeus. Um, so, I mean, Attica uh, or um, Athens web um, um, has a lot, uh, Piraeus is connected somehow with uh, uh, the Athens. Um, there is no any separation between the two cities, let's tell, but I mean, um, uh, there, there are, there are deep, oh, sorry. Uh, there are cities on the way, but they are connected the one to the other, and they are connected also with metro, with uh, all, with highways, and uh, it used to be connected also with tram, but the tram now is not working. So, uh, uh, Maria Scuri's part that we are going to speak about is one of the tram line that uh, has been stopped working since 60 years. Uh, so, here we have the spatial analysis of the videos. Um, and uh, where you can see also the the the, com the um, analysis of population, the analysis of the urban uh, uh, urban uses of the city. And here on the left uh, map, you can see where is the blue and the green. You can see how small are the green spaces actually with a different color. Going through that, uh, you, there are four, five different districts of Piraeus uh, municipality. Uh, and uh, we focused in the two parts uh, that, uh, because we are we start thinking about the green corridors. So we thought about the green corridors and the blue green infrastructures, how we can implement in Piraeus. So uh, the one is with the yellow and red here. Um, and we worked finally in the Maria Spiris Road, so and uh, was the old railway. And the other one is here that was was uh, uh, um, the river um, Kifisos River, that is one of the ancient rivers in Athens that now unfortunately is uh, is uh, covered by the by highway. But underneath you can also still see this, the, the water. So it was our initial thoughts how we can also think do something there. Uh, we didn't go through there because it was a really, really big project and it was not easy to work as a follower city on that. Uh, so we worked uh, mainly in Maria Spiris Road. Uh, we went uh, uh, in the area and we have uh, we seen, we have uh, traced here the different schools uh, that there are in the area since we start thinking, working with the schools while, I mean, during the COVID pandemic. Before, we were not thinking so much. During the COVID pandemic that everything was closed, we thought how we changed a little bit our initial thoughts and we thought how we can work with the schools. Uh, so we start looking about the different consultations, different questionnaires and workshops in the Maria Scuris Road. What are the problems? How we can solve them? And uh, as you can see here, it was the old train line here that you can see the tracy of the train line. Uh, um, we we start thinking. We started thinking about different. Uh, different case studies. Uh, um, I mean, also in Berlin is uh, the Natura Park, uh, um, Sudberg, 
in that was an um, was an inspiration for us. In the highlight and in New York was an inspiration of, for us. So all these trend lines finally as how can be how can be solved in the different case studies how this um, linear uh, alignments. Uh, so in this case, uh, as you can see, some of part of the street has been covered by um, of, of the of the um, traces. Uh, for, of the former rails has been covered and some part has been left uh, visible. Um, so we start uh, speaking with the different stakeholders. We did the kickoff meeting and actually it was much more easier to access finally the stakeholders during the COVID pandemic that everything was closed. I mean, the school teachers, uh, the, uh, from the high school, from primary school, all the different levels. That's how we start working with um, the university uh, stood, I mean, the university here is the university teacher as well uh, from the West Africa University of Athens, that is one of the main stakeholders as well. And so we thought uh, to start uh, work with working with schools. The first schools that through these meetings that we start working was the seventh Lycaum, Lycaum, Lycaum um, I mean, secondary school, and the fifth primary school that they came in this kind of different meetings that we 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 we, we organized and they saw their interest. So here is uh, there are the two schools very close to our, our main axis, Maris Curis Roads. Here is the the uh, and here is the primary school. Uh, starting with uh, the older school, the secondary school, the Lycaum, that was also 17 years students uh, working with, and uh, we work we did uh, different workshops with them also during the COVID, but on but not online on site. And we ended to, to do the planting design in order to plant in, the, in their area and do the urban gardening uh, MBS. Something, as I said at the beginning, that we didn't think. Uh, then we start uh, here, here we can see with the primary school, we do different activities with the primary school. Um, uh, we have also included here the parents that uh, of the schools, uh, the school that they, they, one of the parents was somehow a professional in, in gardening, so he did the design uh, for, for with uh, with um, also with our help, our help. And so we can see here the two cases. Uh, here is uh, we start uh, speaking with uh, the high school, the, the secondary school. Um, it, we were quite uh, we were really locked down, so you can see everybody was with the masks, even outside. And um, uh, actually, the students that we have been involved were seventeen years old students, um, and uh, this this is the the. the um, um, the director of the teachers that actually she was she was also very we're happy because we're lucky that she was also environmentalist and she has organized already in her school an environmental group of students that this group they're going for to study biology and medicine so the, the students they were very good and also they were speaking perfect english as well better than the teachers <laughs> so uh, we while we had our coordinator Ahin university arrived there to work with us they were very very much happy here we gave you can see we gave them the questionnaires and uh, the students and also the teachers are completing the questionnaires here is the first meeting that we had so the questionnaires that we already gave to our student, to the students of the uh, secondary school, uh, we saw that uh, most of the students are, uh, um, uh, they are interesting for the biodiversity. They knew what is natural based solution. And that's because I told you that there were students that they wanted to study biology. And uh, I mean, they were students that they are already had an idea and about the environment. Um, and the question, how how do you know what urban green spaces and uh, what in the, in the, if you know about blue spaces, most of them again knew. I didn't put all the questions here, just I put I, to some of them. Um, 
so most of them, they would like to do something from their environment. And so we're surprised that uh, they don't, they didn't know, I mean, they didn't notice our case studies, Marie Spiris wrote that we wanted to, to, to implement the natural base, the MBS. Um, even if it was just in the corner of the school, they didn't they just pass there, but there was nothing interesting for them. Um, so the, the question, uh, would you like to, to have some activities related with the green space and the school? As you see, it was mostly yes. Would you like to take part of the design workshops and uh, urban spaces of the neighbor? Yes, it was obviously most. So here, here we can see the design procedure with with uh, the students of 17 years old, as I told you. So they had some 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 uh, uh, green beds that were I mean left over uh, also during the COVID time that the schools were closed and all of that. So the the decision was to replant them and try to make something um, even to bring the uh, the biodiversity to bring. Um, uh, uh, the pollinators to to, to plant uh, plants that they're they're uh, bring, bringing in the pollinators. So this was uh, uh, you can see here, or even the planting plan uh, is in Greek, but also in the Latin. So we try to put uh, different plants uh, that uh, flower most time of the year. So we we have the, we can introduce the pollinators. We can introduce uh, um, the butterflies in the area. Again, so we have already discussed with the students about that. And here you can see the students looking at the design and explaining how we did that. But uh, uh, also you can see the students as they start uh, working. Here is, here is also um, from our coordinator from uh, Aachen University explaining and speaking uh, mostly with, about the design. The vice mayor that sees also helping uh, on that. So um, we tried to bring also the, the, the um, uh, municipality here, the, may, the vice mayor, the, the, all, the, all, this, all the staff of the municipality, the green department uh, to work with the students together. And so they, they were doing lessons, how they can seed, they can plant and all of that. Uh, so this is uh, this was uh, the one the one activity. Let's tell the second activity was with the younger students, with the students in the primary school. Obviously, it was quite difficult uh, to give them questionnaires uh, uh, because they were very young. But still, we did some work with the student with um, their teachers, uh, but also um, with uh, the parents, as you can see here, that the parents uh, did the design of. Um, and um, one of the parents also did the design because he was also a professor. But at the same time, we tried to give to the students the idea to design how they want to have their yards. Uh, so you can see the little students here doing their own drawings, get, get, have more ideas how they would like to have their yard because we can see now the yard is just like. Julia. Uh, and yes. Apologies, but considering the time, and if we are approaching the end of the webinar uh, time slot, uh, could you would you mind uh, to speed up a little bit? Because I know that you have over sixty yes. slides, and we are on the twenty sixth. So maybe just key points okay. of, of okay, the rest. Yes. Of the, thank no, you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. This. Okay. Okay. So you can see here about uh, the students' drawings and bringing the what speaking about them um, already about the butterflies, about diversity. So. Uh, they want the school with the flowers, so this was very important for us to explain in drawing students. Here, after that, we did also the planting activities. All together, doing the planting, and it was a very important event that we did with 629 participant offerings that uh, with all this, there were teachers from all over Greece presenting these activities. This was a very good dissemination work for us, but also was something a very, very good, very interesting tool because we get uh, all the impression of all the different uh, um, school uh, teachers uh, all over Greece, uh, what they would like to have in their school. And here is the questionnaire because the questionnaire was doing uh, simultaneously with the, the 
uh, with uh, so you can see the all wanted green spaces with pollinators, playgrounds, drains, and all of that. Uh, so the second uh, uh, in April 2022 until May, we start to do a, a common workshop between uh, one of the main stakeholders, the uh, University of West Africa and Politecnico de Milano, start discussing about that. Uh, we already did um, according to the the birds, the butterflies, the plants of the area. So, so there were our stakeholders here, and here is the Marie Curie road, as you can see. Uh, we did this workshop, uh, so the, the University of West Attica, they went to the seat to, the, to see the area, and they were explaining to the polytechnic students how they use the area. We did videos and all of that, and they tried to work together. Have a very important also uh, external lecturers, as also Catherine Moore, that is a professor from landscape architecture and IFLA Press, ex IFLA Press. And so here is, are some uh, pictures of the students of Politecnico presenting. Here are some of the proposal. I think that they did the proposals we saw in the area, but I mean, they had a very good collaboration with the students of uh, 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 Pireus. Here are the different proposals, the different groups. I think that uh, most of the students are international students in Politecnico, so it was interesting. Um, and so then they start uh, presenting, we, we make a big, um, let's tell, uh, celebration in these two primary schools that actually are located along the, um, along that of Maria Curis is the fifth and the seventh primary school. So here you can see when the teachers are drawing flowers, the students are planning, but the most important thing is that we exhibited the design of our students in Polytechnic and uh, West Attica University and uh, the little students, uh, the, they went there, they're discussing even with my PhD students here in English, they were students that they are immigrant students, uh, uh, minorities that they would like really to understand how is the, the, the and this is, was actually one of the most important uh, issues that came out um, uh, also for the end, uh, I mean, to, to uh, uh, the outcome that finally with this kind of activities, even the little students can understand and can be more sensitive um, under, uh, to understand how the design it works in the area. So you can see also that are the students with the, in the university and the primary school, they, they did also models of their school. And you can see here there are um, something what uh, collecting the water here and watering the air also photovoltaic system. And here you can see all the, the butterflies and the colorful that they are designing. Here is all the designs that uh, the students with the questionnaires that we gave to them. Uh, and it was a very important thing that uh, the teachers of the area, they understand very well the project, project and start to explain to the students what is the project. And they did all the theme. The theme of this day was about project. Uh, the students were trying to explain us how they did this design, for example. This video actually, so I'm not <laughs> going through. Some of the students are also doing uh, different uh, um, artworks with the plants. Um, with, uh, you can see here another other creations, models that they're doing here with the, together with the, with the students of the university. So this is mainly the project, uh, how we work on the project project. And one of the, um, I don't know, I can show you very briefly also the, the um, Eupolis Eupolis project that is also in another, uh, I mean, also uh, this is the consortium. Pireus is participating, uh, coordinator is in University in Athens, in Athens, Polytechnic in Athens. And uh, there are uh, different activities also, as it is uh, among them are the vertical green areas, the building envelope, the outdoor highways. Uh, uh, so, um, oh, sorry. Um, it is okay. The, Maybe we can proceed with, with yes. yeah, concrete actions. So, the 
pocket parks, uh, uh, the green area, the green parts, I mean, water gardens, all of that are going to be proceeded. It's much more a uh, um, new project uh, than, so I'm just showing some of uh, the areas, uh, the botanical garden they want to do um, in the area. And, that's all the temperature measurements and all of that. And um, last, uh, but not least, I could say more or less the same uh, the same conclusion that, I mean, it took quite a lot also the time of the bureaucratical uh, to, 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 to focus on the groups of bureaucracy and um, to, 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 to not to focus, to go out of the bureaucracy and try to bring um, bottom up um, the, the main um, teachers of the schools of the area and work with them was not an easy task. Um, the continuous participation is something important not because now we can see the municipalities continue to, I mean, especially in the project project work with uh, special needs schools and with other schools within this way in order to implement the natural, the MPS um, of urban gardening and um, uh, um, also pollinator biodiversity and also green corridors. And um, uh, so I think the main, the, main, the main output is that we should say as technicians to find, uh, or as researchers to find, uh, to find the people or the teachers or the educators that they, this kind of interest uh, to work with uh, children, to work with the environment, try to find them and, uh, um, and uh, give them the inspiration. And from that time, I think uh, they can work by themselves. I mean, even um, the, we were lucky, I mean, the two last examples that I saw you in Project, um, the, the um, directors of the schools, uh, they were so happy to work. Uh, they they and also to, to speak about it to everybody and not only to the students, but also to the municipality. So uh, this makes also other schools to, to, to like the, to be included in the project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. I think that you managed to really uh, illustrate the impressive atmosphere around the co-creation of nature-based solutions via the presentation. And also I, I would notice that there were several uh, major achievements in, in, in your work and, uh, with the Piraeus team. Uh, one is the very high political support of the vice mayor. The second one would be the, 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 that you managed to engage uh, older teenagers, which, okay, are interested in environmental issues, but still they were quite uh, interested to uh, uh, contribute and actually get involved. And the third is the interest of other teachers across Greece. I think almost 630 teachers interested in the topic are really impressive. Um, now we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Uh, there is one question in the question tab, which was uh, directed towards uh, SOFO, but I think that it can be replied by both panelists. Um, the question was about the CALP3 and the mobile school gardens. Uh, how did you get the parents to co-fund? And is a school yard accessible to everyone? So I think we can just address a little bit the co-funding uh, topic and um, accessibility topic when we intervene in the school area. Perfect, thank you. I just saw it during the second presentation, which was very interesting. So I decided to wait upon it and don't not to answer directly in the chat. Um, I, I think um, I might have not gone into the depth of saying that it was not like parents would pay their own money, that, that we presented the project to the parents' union. And the parents' union in the schools, in the elementary schools where we did this mobile school garden project, uh, projects in each of them, have um, funds like uh, 5,000 euro approximately per year. So they are free together with the school administration to sort of use that money for whatever project um, they want to. And because Pleva is building on that idea that we don't want to only like put projects to like on from our proposal to them and with our financing, but rather having a 
more like joint um, vision, joint wish from both sides, which is a good foundation for future care of, of those projects. Because if you also financially contribute to it, you're more like bound. Of course, the emotional part is the stronger focus, but I think that's also something that really proved to be motivational for, for the for the. So we always ask for if there were opportunities for from the partners to obviously contribute with their own funds. Uh, they, we have to also consider the um, context in mind will be very brief. The schools will be redesigned in the upcoming years. Mm -hmm. It's not from one day to another. It means that uh, the old building is going to be turned down um, and then the entire schoolyard will be digged um, and it won't be pleasing environment for the school children to come to. Um, for the coming months and parents are obviously always having the best interest of their kids <laughs> in mind together with the schools administration so having such mobile school garden having this contact with the daily nature including it in different classes even though they are very small and it would also give them flexibility to roll these gardens with wheels from one location to another mm -hmm. so if the it could not be kept in one place they would roll it outside of the schoolyard wherever they are temporarily that idea was very um, interesting for those school parents as well. So when we proposed the idea as opposed to the permanent school garden, which was initially in the uh, clever contract sort of envisioned, um, they thought that it was a very good um, um, contra proposal. Um, and then obviously that was just left to them. And then the view and the looks was codified together with the involvement of themselves. Um, now, about the accessibility in Hamburg, uh, public schools are accessible after the school time for everyone. So, so that's a very good thing as well for the people living around. They can use the play uh, facilities and etc., which is located on, on the school uh, premises, school yard premises. Um, so general public can access it after the school time period. Obviously, that can bring another challenges. It's a good thing, but then think at the same time you can have problems of vandalism, people removing some plants, taking, etc. But I think uh, because we talk about also the locations of the schools are like in a more like old village center area, uh, like more outskirts of, of those um, of the project area, but people know each other. Most of these children as well maybe live uh, close by. So you have to take these things into consideration when planning all those things and project um, and have also Kara as a, a we had in, in our school project cases, school teachers, which were dedicated and having an interesting interest sort of through the house Meister, like house Kara um, of, of the building to take yeah. care even during the holiday season. So to sort of to water it, etc. Thank you so much, Sofom. And we also have another question in the chat. Uh, Anusha asked uh, how NBS can be promoted at governance scale and Alexandra Malusha from Mixer Association, which is also a F-Police partner from Belgrade, um, underlined that it is a very good point because we need to establish synergies between bottom-up and top-down approaches. So maybe Julia can reflect and then so forth if, if possible. Yeah, actually is is a not is not easy task and especially, I mean, among the different countries. And uh, I mean, we know that uh, many of um, the governors, we could say, they're not also speaking uh, English, <laughs> so they speak the local language. It's another another issue. Um, that's okay. Um, so, but I think, I think, I mean, I mean, from my point of view, I try it with all by all means, even giving them doesn't matter if you don't speak or I mean, the vice mayor or whatever just come i mean we can explain you we can show you it's very important to be here i mean just to try to, to to make them to feel comfortable to be with uh with other i mean this time I mean, the harmonia project uh, uh, that uh, we have in Selsingi, two of the vice mayors finally decide to come and see what we are doing i mean this is i think something to try to 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 to, to show them that okay we're technicians we're working on this level but finally we are we need we need your your um your opinion we need your involvement um and uh, i mean if it wants they can they can go on <laughs> thank you julian and sofa what is your experience from the government structure 
Yes, it's it's a very complex question, and uh, to be very brief, I would not say that 100% it's something that has been resolved. I think what Clever and such research projects try is to sort of test new approaches, tools, methods, and introduce them, um, even if it at first can be very difficult and can have really big opposing, uh, because as I talked about, um, there are different layers, administrative um, and then ministerial and uh, interdepartmental, then there are other institutions and then there are lay people. Um, and what we tried, at least it, sometimes it was as harsh as arguments that we had to do it. The project for CIS co-creation, sort of to say. <laughs> and I think in the process to show meaning um, that it is not actually anything that can create extra burden or problems uh, for them because it was coordinated through us as well. We have to say that the burden of coordination and this direct link has been taken from them via us. So that's why I also had in the lessons learned that this has to be considered that there is a need for someone local actor who does this governance scale coordination type of work and that needs a lot of personal and financial resources to carry and carry the people who are not familiar with it with the ex specialized experts who have a lot on their hand. So that, that is quite a struggle, but also uh, what I can say is well, what we tried is having jaw fixes, for example, interdepartmental. It's not that they always participated, that there was periods where only a few departments came, some other did not come, but having keeping the loop of communication and informing them, oh, now we're doing this, and now the next step is going to be that. So the more you repeat the process, the more you try to explain what the clever vision is, it might take 20 times to explain what is the co-creation or what is the benefit out of it. Um, it might still not be enough, um, but um, it, it already at least breaks the ice in terms of like knowing at least the concept first to start with. Second, some people might take it, some people might like it so much so that they might try it in their projects uh, independent. So uh, I think the correct communication loop um, of like having trying to have as many diverse channels uh, as, as possible, um, also having the web page and doing the news bits. Even even um, organizations and the third party organizations are clicking on it, sending this with a small newsletter or in the email, which is not associated to this news, again, showing this a little uh, success stories, meaning this inauguration, events, attendance, people being happy. So that always pays back and speaks mm -hmm. more than um, the word. So I think there is no one remedy or cue that can resolve this bottom-up, top-down approach. There are struggles on the local side with people as well. I just right now for concentrated with administration, not uh, that much having practice or experience working with lay people, but there is vice versa as well. A lot of prejudices from people as well of working with public and thinking that anything that goes beyond their public uh, private property is not their responsibility. It's only the city, but we want co-created and co-managed spaces it means that there has to be a shift from their side as well, that you can be also carer of this public space. And I think that only can happen through doing, through trying, um, and maybe on the 10th time or 20th, it's um, going to be a, a set practice. But uh, first times, it's always um, a learning curve. Thank you very much, so for very good points. Uh, I would not add anything to, more to that. Uh, and considering that we are over time already, I would just quickly wrap up with uh, several announcements. Uh, the first one is about our next and the last webinar in our uh, Urban by Nature Southeastern Europe uh, series. It will be <coughs> on the 24th of January next year, after the holidays, when we are all fresh and <laughs> uh, rested. Uh, it will be about monitoring, and we will again have um, one speaker from Polimi, from Politecnico di Milano, talking about monitoring of co-creation process, actually. And another uh, partner, again, from Project uh, Project, it will be a representative of the city of Zagreb, who is actually a um, front runner, another front runner in this, in this very interesting project. I would also like to uh, underline and remind you that you can see all the recordings of our previous webinar at the YouTube channels of Cities with Nature and Clever Cities Project. And this recording will, will also be available there. And I would like to remind you to fill in the Urban by Nature survey uh, if you haven't been done that already, because we do like to actually implement co-creation and create a, a future content together with you. And if you have any question, uh, feel free to uh, contact us from CEUS or our colleagues from ICLEI World Secretariat. 
Thank you all very much for participation at this event and special thank you for our excellent finalists. Thank you.